Greetings everyone, hello and welcome, I am your channel host. If you're new here and you enjoy listening to horror stories, join us, click subscribe. Also, leave a like to show your support before we get started. Thank you, let's begin. A year after I was done with college, I moved between jobs. It took a lot of work to find a job that could cover every expense. It wasn't an easy transition as a college graduate working under minimum wage and paying rent on my crappy apartment. I had no savings or credit cards, and there were times when it was hard to live through the day. But either way, I always found a way. In my last job, I worked as a delivery guy. It wasn't what I wanted, but strangely, the job had this kind of peace. The routine of moving boxes, carrying heavy loads, walking to destinations, and just driving about was the exact opposite of anything else I would have chosen. It was also too domestic. I didn't know why I took the job at first, but the more time I spent there, the more I started to like it. After a few months, my boss noticed something odd about me, and called in some favours. Soon, he started giving me more responsibilities than I could handle. I didn't mind helping out, it made his life easier. I was now responsible for delivering food stuff. The best part was getting paid extra though, because you got to deliver everything yourself. My boss liked me, which was good, always a good scenario. We even joked sometimes. The other people who worked in the restaurant where we work loved me, also. She said that I was ambitious, which is a good thing. They didn't know if it was because my boss thought I was smart, or because I was cute, which was both. Well, I think it was. People didn't expect you to be quiet, instead they expected you to talk about their favourite foods or dogs as you delivered things. My boss was so happy when she heard I liked dogs and made me work at the shelter every weekend. She didn't know that I was not into dogs, but I liked the job and that was enough for her. It was just before Christmas, everyone would start coming in. The place was filled with families, old folks, kids and couples. Some were in wheelchairs, and some held each other and leaned on their loved ones for support. They were here to celebrate the holidays. I helped them with whatever they needed. After work during closing hours, I stayed behind and helped even though my shift ended in the evening around 6pm. I stayed back a little and helped the restaurant. My boss was pretty busy yelling orders. Sometimes I wonder what she was doing owning a warehouse and a restaurant, but everything makes sense whenever I see her get bossy. It was late when everyone was leaving. I still hadn't left work yet. No one was waiting for me at my apartment, so it made sense that I hung out here during Christmas. Although she tried to send me back home several times, I didn't leave. After the rush hour, she asked me to see her in the office. I waited for her to cool off and walked into her office. My boss had her head to the table, and I just realised how hard things are for her, and why she kept yelling at everyone not to make a mistake in their delivery. Hi, she said, as I walked with a smile and a little grease on her cheek. Ma'am, you called, I said trying to point out what was on her face. She took a handkerchief and cleaned it off. Just call me Maureen, thanks. Why didn't you leave when I asked you to? She asked. I... I didn't want to go home. I was spending the Christmas by myself, so I decided just to stay here. I smiled. What about your family? Maureen asked. It's just me. The look on her face says it all. I'm sorry. I didn't know. It's okay. You're allowed to ask. We sat in awkward silence for a few minutes. 
Then she got up and asked me to wait there. Maureen ran out of her office and I looked around a bit. When she was back, she had a box of pizza. She placed it on the table and turned it to me. Want some? Why not? We ate and we talked about a lot of things. I told her about my childhood and my aspirations. We talked about her life and why she decided to be busy with the restaurant and warehouse. About the job you said you wanted. I've heard of this that offers all kind of job. Wouldn't it be wise if you check it out? That way you can be sure you're not being scammed, Maureen told me while we talked. I got onto this Craigslist website and found an extra job. I needed more money and I told Maureen about it. She was skeptical, but I was totally delusional. Anyway, after finishing up the pizza and having a chat with her, I headed back to my apartment. I was too exhausted, so I fell asleep immediately. We were on Christmas break, so there was no work the next day. I decided to sleep in. The next day I took my time and did some research. I checked the listings and got an interview in two weeks, which was good. It also happened that my boss had gone on vacation and she wasn't there, so I didn't have to deal with any more annoying customers. Few of us were employed anymore anyway, and I had no problems. I was expecting to be laid off, not because Maureen's nasty, but because she was simply reducing the staff. At the same time, I also went online, which surprised me. The job I found sounded great, although I needed to figure out exactly how much the pay would be, or what type of security guard I would be. I figured it out by looking at the picture they gave me. I already knew I was fit, and I've been running since kindergarten. That's where I made my mistakes. That wasn't how things were meant to be. I had never met someone I enjoyed talking to since my parents died, and the more time I spent with these people, the more I wanted to spend with them. I told Maureen I got the interview on the day of the interview. We spoke for a while, then drove over to the place. It looked like a simple office complex and I walked in. The receptionist looked odd, like she was out of place. I couldn't put my finger on it, but that's how I felt when I saw her. She directed me to a room where I was asked to wait. It was an empty room, except for a table and a chair at the centre. Now, I was uncomfortable with it. But since the pay was good, and I'd already met the reception lady, I kind of put my anxiety at the back of my head. I decided to bite my tongue and just go through with it. I sat on the table. The table had a note at the center, with the words written on it, Reaction Speed. Excuse me, what is going? Before I could finish my sentence, I felt something fly past me and land on the wall. I touched my face to see the cut it made. I groaned in pain, but it was bearable. What the hell is wrong with you? I called out. I ran to the door and tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. Then I heard another flying towards me. I dodged and took cover with the table. That was a bad idea. As I turned the table to the other side to block whatever was shooting darts at me, the force became intense as it pierced through the table and stabbed into me. It felt like my whole body was burning. Everything felt numb and it was dark and cold. Then, all at once, I screamed. I knew Maureen would have been able to hear the scream. She was sat outside at the edge of the road in the car. I was in so much pain. It hurt so badly like knives slicing inside of me. I screamed and jumped away from the pain. I dropped to the ground and looked up to see whoever shot the dart. I couldn't see anyone or anything. My vision was blurry. I felt like throwing up everywhere. I decided to run for the window at the edge of the room. I ran as fast as possible, but could feel the darts on my skin as they shot at me. I broke the window, climbed out, and landed on my back where the darts were lodged. 
I screamed in agony as the pain muddled my mind. I cried as I tried to drag myself to the car. Once again, I tried to open my car door. Maureen wasn't there. Where the fuck was she? I felt numbness all up my arms. I couldn't move them properly. I started to panic. Then I started to hear Maureen scream from inside the building. I tried to open the car door with my other arm, but it felt like I was losing my mind. The last thing I saw was the darkness. I lost consciousness until the darkness began to fade away. Then everything turned black like the world was spinning out of control. When I woke up, I found myself lying in a hospital bed. My back was covered in bandages, and I had tubes connected all through my arms and my veins. I could hear a machine. It was making all these funny noises, these beeps and these jump sounds. My eyes stung as I blinked, trying to glimpse at my surroundings. I felt nauseous and thirsty as hell. I started to feel dizzy. Then I heard a familiar voice. It was Maureen. She had a cast on her arm. She came to sat next to me, along with three other nurses. They were calm at first, and though I was begging for an explanation, they told me it was best for me to keep my heart rate as low as possible. I must have stayed awake for only a few minutes, and then I drifted back, losing complete control of consciousness. I think I was asleep for a whole day or two. When I woke up, there was no one there. I was still in the ward, and I seemed to have been changed into a different coloured gown. Eventually, they sat me up and fed me my first amount of food. It was disgusting, sloppy hospital food. Sweet potato soup, but it was vile. Maureen arrived. This time she still had the cast on. My vision wasn't as blurry this time. I could see she had cuts and bruises all over her face. This time the police turned up. Two cops sat down by the left side of my bed as Maureen sat to the right. They had a notebook. Everything was still a daze to me, but they asked me to explain as much as I possibly could remember. So I did so. To skip all the painful part of this story so it doesn't bring back trauma, fast forward a few months later, they never found who did this. The Craigslist ad was pulled and they seemed to be using some type of VPN and virtual machine on their network, whatever that means. The cops tried to investigate, but it seemed to be a gang or group of sickos who wanted to torture and hurt people by luring them in through Craigslist ads. Please, be careful. I survived, but others probably didn't. You have to pay up Greg, or I'm throwing your stuff the moment you leave today, the landlord yells as I walked into the apartment. Dean, can you at least give me a week? I've never failed to pay up for years, why would I do that now? I asked as I saw Dean with his hand on his forehead. Look, I don't know what's going on, and I'm pretty sure it is serious. The only reason I'm not thinking much about this is because it's you. By this time next week, you better have my money, or I'm getting a new tenant. I watched Dean walk towards the stairway, and I ran my hand through my hair. I was behind on all my monthly payments, and barely had enough time to live through all of that. Although I work at the school's library, the money is decent enough, but we hadn't been paid for that week and I was all out of savings. I spent the entire day wondering how I could come up with something that could cover the rent. I could handle the rest of the bills when I finally got paid from my job. As always, my mind was just blank. I had no idea what to do next. 
I fell asleep hungry on my couch. During the day, I hung out with Tristan. He was one of my friends, and we were around each other a lot. We were like drinking buddies, and we never went past that. Tristan could read body language, and as usual, he knew something was up with me and dragged me out of the house. We went drinking. It was far too early, but he knew I wouldn't talk if I wasn't drunk. We talked about random shit, and we had good laughs. He paid the tab since he was the one who dragged me out. Then we started walking back to the apartment. Tristan pestered me, asking me what was wrong and why I looked like a sad case. I didn't want to say anything initially, but Tristan would not let things be, so he kept on poking at me and making fun of my face until I told him what was wrong. Bro, what the hell is wrong with you? Tell me. No. I just don't want to talk about it. We had to continue talking like nothing happened. We walked to my apartment, played some video games and fell asleep on the couch. Later that day, Tristan ordered pizza and walked around the apartment like he was taking a tour. Once the pizza was here, we ate in silence until he left. I contacted the library later that day to see if my check had been sent out. I don't know what happened, but I heard someone stole the funds meant for the library. Everyone was panicking. Although I didn't, I had many reasons too. I stayed home wondering what to do with myself. I didn't want to attend class, but I was too tired to think, so I avoided it. I sat there staring at the ceiling. I tried counting sheep, but the number of them just seemed to add together. They seemed endless, no matter which way I turned. Then it struck me, what if I moved away? It might make the bills go down, or else I'd have to work even harder if I wanted to survive. I'd need an excuse not to show up at work every day, but if I move I'll have less money for food and I didn't even have enough not to move, so everything was pointless. I went to a coffee shop. It was after three in the afternoon and there wasn't much business, but it wasn't bad enough for me to feel guilty sitting at a table all alone. I was exhausted from the day's events, so the idea of a small group of people talking together felt impossible. Even though I wanted to write, I just wanted the time to pass and to be alone. My phone rang. It was Tristan. I answered and I told him where I was. I waited until Tristan got to the coffee shop. He tossed an envelope towards me and I could see the smug look on his face as I began to open it. It was several $20 bills. I didn't count them as I shoved the envelope into my pocket. Where the hell did you get this? What do you mean? They're mine. Look, I know you won't ask for help, even when you're dying. So, take it. Do not give it back to me, Tristan said as he ordered a cup of coffee. I don't even have enough to pay you back. I don't know when I'll be paid. I know, I'm not worried about that. So I was thinking, since your apartment is big enough for two people, why don't you rent out the other bedroom? I'm sure there are a lot of guys wanting to move out of the dorms anyway. I didn't think of that fact, as I thought it was illegal for something like that. I sat there as Tristan sipped on his coffee. How do I rent out the place? I asked. Tristan showed me a website where I could put up images and create an ad for the room. I thanked him and walked back home. I took pictures of the second bedroom and uploaded them. Later that day I got several responses. I had to choose a guy who had similar interests to mine, as I didn't want things to get awkward when we were together. This dude's name was David. We were the same except for our majors, which were different. I majored in English and David was in geology. I sent a message to David telling him that I chose him. 
Later that night, I paid Dean, my landlord, the money that Tristan gave me. We settled our differences, and I was certain I wouldn't see him for another couple months. I knew having David stay technically wasn't allowed, but I didn't give a shit, as long as my uh, landlord didn't find out. Then, it was all good, right? Anyway, David settled in well. Later that night, after I paid Dean, David came over. He needed to live in the apartment ASAP. He'd been kicked out of his parents' house. I left the apartment to go hang out with Tristan while David made himself familiar with the house. When I got back, David was fast asleep. I didn't think much about it, so I went to bed too. I woke up to the sound of some whispering. I couldn't make out what was being said, so I just turned over and tried to go back to sleep. I opened my eyes, and I was the only one in the bedroom. I sighed, and then I got up. It sounded like the whispering was coming from within the room. I walked to the living room and stared at the other side. David's bedroom door was wide open, and I could see that he wasn't in bed. Surprised, I walked to the kitchen and turned around. But he stood there, leaning over the counter. I was so confused what he was doing. He had no top on, but seemed to have some type of pajama trousers. He was facing the kitchen counter near the cooker. He looked like he was doing something, so I just called his name out briefly. David, what's up? He doesn't reply, he just continues to do whatever he's doing on the counter. All of a sudden, I walk around to get a closer look at what he's doing. As I got closer, I could see that he was chopping something. He had pulled out one of the chopping boards, which I rested against the side of the counter. It was a clean one, I remember drying it up earlier that evening. He had a knife out. And at first, I thought he was making some food. He was cutting something, some type of meat, but it didn't look right. As I got closer, I sure enough saw that this meat had hair. It had ginger and white fur all over it. Then, I got another step closer, and saw that David was decapitating a guinea pig. He had sliced it through the middle, and its guts were all over the chopping board on the kitchen counter. What's worse is the guy wasn't even awake. He was sleepwalking. He had taken one of his pet guinea pigs, picked it out of the cage, killed it, and then cut it up. He was sleepwalking, and at the same time was eating its insides. I almost threw up there and then on the spot. I turned around and went back to my room. I shut the door quietly and called Tristan. I asked Tristan what should I do. The guy's sleepwalking and eating his own guinea pig. He's fucking insane. It's disgusting. I was dry heaving at this point. I hadn't eaten in anything in hours, thank God. Tristan told me to kick him out of the apartment or at least wake him up. So, that's what I did. While still on the phone to Tristan, I walked over to David, tapped him on the shoulder while he was still eating his guinea pig's intestines. He didn't respond. I tapped him a little harder. Still, he didn't respond. That's when Tristan called out, you have to yell in their face. Some sleepwalkers are so difficult to wake up. I grabbed his shoulder, shook him like crazy and screamed David into his ear. Then, he absolutely shit himself and fell backwards. He fell to the floor and looked terrified. He had the blood from his hamster all over his mouth. His hands were covered. Eventually, he got up off the floor. He looked so confused yet terrified at the same time. I looked in his eyes, thinking, Really? I pointed to his hamster on the chopping board. He looks at his hands and just starts screaming. He turns around after getting up, runs back into his room and slams the door behind him. Then, next thing I know, he's rushing to pack all his bags. 
He must have taken him like five minutes. He got all his stuff together, including the cage with his one alive hamster and a guinea pig, and just left. His third guinea pig? He just left on the chopping board, dead. He ran out and I never saw the dude again. It was genuinely fucking insane. I was sitting by my parents swimming pool, drinking beer as the sun went down. The weather this summer had been amazing so far, and I'd already got a good tan, and I'd not even been abroad this year. The year had started off not great for me. In March, the company I was working for suddenly called everyone in on a Monday morning. They told us the company was going through a challenging period and that with effect, immediately basically, all overtime would be stopped. For me, this was a huge loss of over 35 hours. It made a big dent in my monthly take-home pay. This additional pay helped me pay my apartment rent, my food, and everything else for that matter. Then, one month after that announcement, my landlord pops a letter under my door, to inform me that unfortunately, he's having to put up all his apartment rents by 10% starting in one month's time. Shit, I thought. Is this some sort of conspiracy? How? It just seemed to all be happening at me at the same time. Once I sat down and did some number crunching, I realised I was going to have to get a part-time additional job to make up the shortfall. It was either that or I'd have to give up my apartment and get a smaller place to live with a lower rent. The problem was that I'd been living in my apartment for 18 years. I really liked it. It had big rooms, views across a park, and it was in a nice part of town. I was in no hurry to give it up. I started looking for part-time jobs to make up my money. After a couple of weeks, I found an evening job in a fast food restaurant. They wanted someone for three evenings a week and a Saturday lunchtime. I went in for the interview, and after half an hour, they offered me the job, so I accepted. The first couple of weeks were hard, as I was doing a full-time office job during the day, then having to come home, grab something to eat quick, and head off out the door fast to get to the restaurant to do a further 5 hour shift. Then I'd go home, get to bed, and I'd be exhausted. Before the alarm went off next morning, I would start it all over again. It was a nightmare cycle, but I didn't have a choice. Eventually, over the weeks it got better. I worked out the best pattern of doing the two jobs so that I was getting good sleep and working just hard enough at the two jobs to keep my head above water. It was at the fast food restaurant that I met Tony. He had been working there for 15 months full time and had recently made up to a shift leader. He had a great sense of humour and was always playing jokes on the workers. This didn't change when he was made up to shift leader either which was good as the whole team liked him. The boss kept telling Tony that now he was a shift leader, he had to stop larking around with the staff and make sure things were done right, and when necessary, tell staff if they weren't doing their job properly. Tony kept saying to me, if you want extra hours, I can give them to you. But I said I couldn't. I work all day at my other job. Thanks for the offer, but it would just be impossible. Some of us started meeting up when we weren't working and doing some sports and stuff. Tony also joined. We did a bit of soccer here and there. We weren't very good at it, but it was all just a good laugh trying. Then Tony started asking us around to his apartment. 
we got some takeaways and of course a few drinks. One Friday evening at around 9pm when we were all on shift, we had a nightmare. A fire broke out in the kitchen. We all tried to contain it with the kitchen fire extinguishers, but it was too much. All the diners were evacuated safely and the fire department were called and quickly brought it under control. There was a huge amount of damage and the whole kitchen area was basically unrecognisable. The boss called us to a meeting the following afternoon in a local hotel. He informed us that the restaurant would be closed for approximately two weeks while repair work was carried out. More importantly, he told us that while the work was carried out, he would honour all our salaries during the closure period which made us all pretty relieved to say the least, especially the team members who were full time and relied on the income to pay all their bills. Two days after the announcement, Tony contacted me and said, Jake, how about doing something a bit different this weekend? He said he was going to visit his parents in Michigan as they had a large house right on the lake. Would I like to come with him, he said, and do some canoeing? I said it sounds great to me, I'd never been canoeing in my life, why not? I had a free weekend, so Friday morning he decided to drive me. It was 9 o'clock in the morning, Tony pulled up on the drive, I got out of my apartment, it was only a small two story building. I greeted him and off we went, the trip from Ohio to Michigan where his parents live took just over five hours. Tony did all the driving but we had a couple of stops to break it up. He was right about his parents being, well, pretty wealthy. They had a lovely garden with a swimming pool and a pier leading out into the lake. He introduced me to his parents and they said that I was most welcome. His mum showed me to my room which overlooked the rear garden and lake. The next day after a good night's sleep and a full breakfast, Tony said, Well Jake, it's about time we showed you some Michigan canoeing. We got changed and headed down to the garden to the pier where I could see a green canoe fixed to the right side of it. I got in carefully, being careful not to tip over. I still nearly fell out as I wasn't prepared for how careful you needed to be getting in and out of a canoe to much of uh, Tony's amusement. Once we had paddled away some distance from the pier, I started to appreciate how peaceful a hobby it was. There was not engine noise anywhere. Wildlife, the lake, the fresh air, it was amazing. Then Tony produced a couple of fishing rods from the bottom of the canoe along with some bait and a box. Before we knew it we were fishing. Tony ended up catching three fish, and I amazingly enough managed to catch my first ever fish, which practically made my day. When we got back, Tony said, I'll take the fish up to mum, as it looks like they're getting the barbecue ready, so we can have fresh fish as well as sausages. Can you tie the canoes up to the pier for me? I said sure. As we sat around eating our barbecued fish and sausages, I said to Tony, I think canoeing is pretty awesome, I'd definitely do that again bro. Fishing as well was pretty good, I always thought it was for old men or boring people, but when you actually catch something, the suspense and the excitement is well worth it. Later on as I helped them clear away the barbecue, I happened to look down to the end of the garden by the pier. I suddenly realised something was wrong with the view, but at first I couldn't recall what was different. Then, like an express train, it hit me full force in the stomach. The canoes were gone. Tony saw my expression and said, Jake, what's up? I pointed towards the pier and said, the canoes. He raced down the garden to the pier with me, close behind. He looked all around and out into the lake, there was no sign of anything. Shit, he said, dad is going to kill me. Are you sure Jake, you tied them on properly, 
just like you saw them when we released them. I started thinking. I could remember placing the canoe rope around the pier block, but I couldn't remember tying it on. Tony, I'm so sorry. He looked at me and then at the grass and sighed. Quick, he said, we have a couple of kayaks in the garage. We'll have to take them out now and see if we can find it. They probably drifted off somewhere. God knows how far, though. We spent over four hours looking, but there was no sign anywhere. The canoes almost topped $1,000 for both of them. When we got back, I said to his dad that I was very sorry, but it was my mistake, as I didn't think I secured the tie rope properly. I could see from his expression that he wasn't happy, but that he was very diplomatic, and said that it was unfortunate, but these things happen. I could tell deep down that he was super pissed. The drive home the following day was awkward and difficult. I knew that Tony's dad had argued with him about losing the canoes, but I decided that when we got home, I was going to go on Craigslist and try and buy them a replacement canoe for the one I lost. It would be basically all my savings, but oh well. After looking I found one. It wasn't green unfortunately, this one was almost like a dark brown. From the pictures it looked similar to the one I lost, and the price was inside my budget, so I rang the seller. A man answered the phone, and at first the signal was a bit crackly, I couldn't really understand what he was saying. After a minute or two of awkwardness, the line managed to clear up. I was talking to a man named Ethan. I said to him about the canoe, and the story that I'd lost my friend's parents. He just laughed and just said yeah, it depends what brand they are, but they could have been pretty damn expensive. I agreed that I would meet him at his property at 11am on the Saturday. He gave me his address in the same place as me in Ohio. Similar town. I pulled up outside and checked the house number, then I drove up his gravel driveway. I parked at the side of the house which looked like it had seen better days. I got out and went up onto the porch. On the door there was a note that seemed to have been glued or stuck to it. On the note were a block capital sentence. If you knock and get no answer, go round back probably working down lake. I knocked and waited. Sure enough, there was no answer, so I did what I was asked and walked around the back. The rear yard area was full of old machine parts and truck tires. I called out several times as I navigated all round the items lying around, but there still was no sign of anyone. I headed down the garden to the small pier that led out onto this lake. There, tied onto it, was a brown canoe with two paddles laying across the seats. As I looked all around the area, I could see that this end of the lake was deserted. The sides were all heavily overgrown as well. I called out again and waited, but again there was no answer. I just stood there silently and tried to listen. Then I began to hear a faint voice calling out. I couldn't make out what they were saying, or at first where it was coming from. I looked all around trying to pinpoint it. Then, over the far side, I could make out some sort of small door in the other bank. It was all overgrown except for the entrance. Then I heard the muffled cry again. It was definitely coming from that entrance area, so I decided to get into the canoe and go over and see what was happening. I paddled across until I reached the far bank. I headed for the small low door and I paddled in. I ducked my head as I went in. Inside, the interior was lit by two oil lamps hanging from hooks on the back wall. I paddled in as there was a small jetty inside which already had a small rowing boat tied up by a ladder leading up onto the pier. I tied the canoe onto the rowing boat, 
making sure it was properly tied this time, lol. I climbed into, trying not to fall in. As I was doing this, I heard the muffled call this time louder. I got to the ladder and pulled myself up, to be greeted by a body of a man lying sideways down with a large pool of coagulated blood around him. His head was resting on one of the short pier supports. As I stepped towards him I heard a cracking sound. I looked down to see that the pier must have given way suddenly, as there was a hole in the top of the pier. His right foot was down inside of it, so I'm guessing he must have fallen as soon as his foot went through, causing him to lose his balance and then crack his head as he went down. I bent over him and tried to feel for a pulse, but there wasn't one. His skin was ice cold to the touch, and he was definitely dead. I then heard another call again. It was coming from behind a door at the back of the area. I carefully stepped over the man and went towards the door. There was a key in the lock, so I turned it. Then I pulled down the handle and the door opens inwards. Inside was pitch black, but I could hear something moving around. I looked around for a light switch, and then found a hanging light cord, so I pulled it down, and all of a sudden the room lit up in an orange glow, to reveal, to my absolute horror, two partially clothed women tied to wooden chairs in the middle of a small room. One seemed to be conscious, the other had her head slumped forward on her chest. Both had been gagged. I rushed forward and removed the gags. I untied them. To the side of the room was a table with two large bottles of water. I grabbed one and gave it to the conscious woman, and slowly the other one came round. I tried to reassure her and then hand her some water. I grabbed my phone from my pocket. It only had one bar of coverage, but it was just enough to call 911. I gave them the address of Ethan, this supposed man I'd come to buy a canoe from on Craigslist. I used a rowing boat, and as we walked carefully past the man's body, they confirmed he was the one that had kept them captive for four days. It turns out they were friends, and they went to a party. This guy went by in a breakdown truck and offered to help and said that he would drop them off at their friend's house. He hitched up the car, but when they got in the cab, he put some chemicals over their mouths and next thing they both woke up tied in that room by the water. Luckily, after a short stay in hospital, they both recovered from their ordeal physically, but mentally was another matter.